Thanks for the invitation. Thanks also to Carol uh, for inviting me to give a talk. Um, so I thought I'd just start with what's out there already, and um, people here will know that uh, the there are therapies out there that have modest benefit. Um, so the two that are approved around uh, Riliazole, um, Brad uh, uh, showed you a slide of that modest uh, benefit uh, there, uh, which really translated to patients with the bulbar onset disease, largely because I think they were able to show that uh, difference. And that drug came out in about uh, 1995. Um, it, uh, in our clinic, about two thirds of patients take it. Uh, it's usually well tolerated. And uh, the main reason people w don't take it is, is because its efficacy is modest. We can touch on that in the questions if uh, people like. Uh, the second drug that's uh, come out and uh, FDA approved in the US is uh, Adaravone. And I've just put up here that uh, the patient uh, group that uh, showed that benefit, uh, because uh, the key people in Ireland and, uh, and Holland uh, said that, well, if we applied all of those criteria to, pa to the whole group of patients with uh, motor neuron disease, probably only 2% of patients would actually uh, find benefit from the Adaravone. And uh, you know, there were some concerns that they uh, um, went and uh, did a subgroup analysis on their original study. But perhaps the main reason that um, uh, that drug has not been used in many patients that I'm aware of in Australia has been the cost, and so it hasn't received funding, uh, and also its intensity. So it's uh, um, basically two weeks on the drug, two weeks off, and it's an infusional drug. So again, I'm happy to uh, chat more about that, but it certainly, in my experience, hasn't really uh, taken off uh, in an Australian setting. Uh, I'm not mentioning it in, in under clinical trials, but there's meant to be a clinical trial of uh, Adaravone as an oral preparation that's going to be, uh, I mean, earlier in the year they were talking about starting that study in December of this year, uh, but I haven't heard anything uh, recently about that. And before I actually touch on clinical trials, I'll point out um, um, that there's a clear benefit both in symptoms and in survival for uh, respiratory support and uh, uh, David gave a nice talk this morning about that and the role of non-invasive ventilation and also nutritional support uh, and considering uh, ways of feeding uh, is also important. And then I think as you've uh, learnt from the other talks and uh, uh, Peter nicely uh, showed that the symptom management is also very important as well as quality of life. So those two pictures came from the MND Care as part of the MND RIA website. So if you wanted to look at those in more detail, that's where they are. So um, I'll just touch a little bit on some issues with clinical trials, uh, tell you about uh, currently active trials, tell you about some untested compounds that I'm aware of, and I'm sure in questions uh, more will come up. Basically every clinic that we do, uh, someone's asking a, uh, about a certain compound and uh, um, you know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm being educated every clinic I do. Uh, and uh, I'll also talk about uh, future therapies. And I'll, as uh, Brad said, I'll acknowledge Ian Davis, who really uh, gave us a little bit of a um, gave us a little bit of momentum to really try and push forward with clinical trials. So the main issue with clinical trials in motor neuron disease is that most of them don't get up to the true phase three studies. Um, so most of them um, start off uh, being tested. Uh, in animal models, um, and then they go to a phase one study. And that's where most motor neuron disease uh, trials are at the moment. And a phase one trial is looking at uh, safety and tolerability. So what happens is people usually collect some efficacy markers and use those efficacy markers to inform about whether they take the study on to what's called a phase two or phase three study. And in the last few years, uh, there's really only been two large phase uh, two studies uh, that didn't show any benefit. So the large phase two, phase three studies are usually funded by large pharmaceutical companies. The cost is in tens of millions of dollars, whereas the smaller phase one studies are, are usually um, a, cu a couple of million at most. So 
that's one of the issues is that the large studies really do need to be properly funded. And I'll put in brackets here failed MND uh, trials because I think people would say, well, there's limitations in, that tri in those trials. Did they study the dose of the uh, compound correctly? Um, did the heterogeneity that I think Thanuja talked about this morning, uh, did they properly consider that? Um, did they, pro you know, there's uh, many reasons why uh, um, studies were not, uh, were called failed, but perhaps weren't looked at uh, as rigorously as uh, some studies do in other areas such as oncology. So the key, whoops. I can see it. So it's dropped off there. Yep. So what I've got there is the major issues with trying to run a good phase two, phase three trial is that you start with a protocol and you stick to the protocol. So it's got what's called good medical practice that the people, the researchers are doing have to have uh, been um, accredited in good medical practice. There has to be an ethics approval. Uh, and in our hospital, at least, the, uh, the ethics committees are very supportive of uh, motor neuron disease trials. Our ethics committee uh, understand it's a terrible disease and that clinical trials are needed. And it's also important in any trial that you have an independent data management control. We're all naturally biased in what we do, so we do need to be doing things in a proper randomised and controlled way. So you've got to establish and say it at the outset, what are your inclusion and exclusion criteria? You've got to randomise subjects, uh, and the question is, do, you know, should patients be on placebo or not? Uh, which is, again, a reasonable question to chat about at the end. And patients start off on a treatment, and the analysis at the end should reflect which arm of the, uh, the two patients' uh, groups were in. And you've got to establish clearly defined endpoints um, and as well as uh, secondary endpoints. And that's one of the tricky things at the moment in uh, uh, trials is that those endpoints in motor neuron disease have limitations. So the two standard ones are used are the ALS-FRS uh, questionnaire and force vital capacity. And people will use other ones and survival uh, is an uh, endpoint that's used, although most of the current trials are only running for six months. And so survival is not really well represented in that. Um, the issue for new drugs is that they're the uh, first in human studies that they have to go through a very rigorous process in animal uh, models to test safety, uh, and that really slows up compounds uh, in terms of getting them to uh, human trials. Um, Brad's talked about uh, repurposed drugs, so trying to look at drugs that are already known to be safe in humans uh, and uh, using those in a, um, uh, in a motor neuron disease population. And finally, Brad, uh, the N equals one, uh, trials, which I reckon Brad's, uh, some of Brad's work would be uh, well suited to that. So having a patient who's very carefully studied uh, and being able to see that effect of that drug uh, in, in, uh, in his model would be uh, a nice application of these N equals one studies. Uh, and combination therapies have never really been looked at in motor neuron disease. And if we use the example of the HIV population, the individual drugs didn't work but the combination is what's made such a, a major difference to HIV survival. So um, at present there are three actively recruiting uh, studies in Australia. And you could say a few years ago there, were, well, there weren't any. And so um, the first one is the TEAL study, which is led by Matthew Cannon and uh, Steve Vukic from Sydney. And they're recruiting 121 patients and studying a drug called Tecfidera. I think there, you know, uh, 80 or 90 patients have been uh, recruited. Uh, Susan Mathers, David Schultz, uh, Marilyn Needham, and uh, our site are the main ones. Uh, there is a randomisation where most people get more people get the drug than placebo, um, and uh, uh, there's a number of efficacy markers that are being looked at, and so that one's uh, actively recruiting. Uh, the Fortitude ALS. Uh, is also through similar sites uh, across Australia. It's a uh, 
study led by the US. Uh, it's a drug trying to increase muscle contractility, and it's based on a drug uh, that seemed to show some survival benefit in respiratory function. All three of these studies are oral tablets. Um, and that one's closing recruitment or, uh, or virtually closed its recruitment uh, now, as, uh, as far as I'm aware. Um, and uh, the last one is a European study um, on a drug that increases the sensitivity of the nerve to the muscle connection to try and improve muscle function. Uh, and that one's only just started, and so that one uh, is uh, actively recruiting. We haven't recruited yet for that one, and maybe in Queensland, about eight to 10 subjects are there, and uh, in our TEAL study there's, uh, from uh, Queensland, there's about 18 to 20 subjects. So um, those are, are the actively recruiting uh, studies at the moment in, uh, in Australia. Um, I've just put up what information that you could get if you go looking for it, uh, and this is again from the MNDRIA website. Uh, and talks a little bit about uh, um, the background to the study, where it's up to, and which sites are involved. And uh, you'll also see that for other studies. Um, so the COPPER ATSM study has been one that's uh, recently uh, completed recruiting uh, through Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, Peter Crouch has been a major driver of uh, that study, uh, and he presented yesterday on the rationale for that. Uh, the other one that was presented yesterday uh, was the drug Trimac, which is a combination of antiretroviral therapy uh, um, uh, with sites through Sydney and Melbourne, uh, particularly uh, uh, Sydney where Dominic Rowe uh, presented yesterday. Uh, the data that he presented yesterday looked very promising, uh, but again, it's, it was a phase one study looking at safety and tolerability, but collected some endpoint. But it sounds like they're going to take that further to a phase two study. The uh, future therapies that are worth mentioning, and these are the ones that I know about from Queensland, uh, Trent Woodruff uh, presented uh, yesterday on uh, PMX205, uh, which is a complement-based uh, uh, drug, complement-based inhibitor. Um, so it's acting on the idea that somehow the immune system is involved in modulating the disease. And if I took a step back, that's also how the TEAL studies, uh, the rationale for that, is based on the idea that microglia, which are the main, one of the main immune cells in the brain, have a role in playing how the disease progresses and propagates. Uh, Perry Bartlett uh, has also had a, uh, uh, an antibody to FA4, which uh, he's planning to take to a uh, phase uh, one study next year. Um, and, uh, and also we've been involved this year in a study of uh, IC14, which is a master regulator of the immune system, uh, and we studied a phase one study in, in that drug, which we've been hoping to take to a phase two study across Sydney and Melbourne, um, but um, you know, the funding required to push that to the next level uh, is our current challenge. The area that probably excites me um, most of all is this area of oligonucleotide antisense therapies, and you know that's a mouthful that I've, uh, um, that uh, I'm now starting to get right. And uh, it um, um, it's basically saying that for a known gene mutation, you'll be able to change that uh, single point gene mutation. And uh, SOD1 targeting trials have begun. And uh, I think the Biogen have got a little study on the C9 ORF72. So in some ways, those people who think that they've, got, they've been dealt the wrong hand because they've got a genetic form of motor neuron disease, you, you never know. You might just find that that's the ones that um, uh, are the first ones that make a major difference in uh, survival. Um, in terms of other therapies, uh, there are many. So I've put up uh, the name of a few here. Uh, Ken uh, had a slide where he mentioned L-serine, which is based on the BMAA. Um, and I think there might be a study of that somewhere in the US occurring. Um, the RCH4 is a really new one that uh, seems to might perhaps only um, been in Queensland that uh, recently it's from a UK uh, um, based compound. Uh, when you go to their web page, I really can't find too much uh, detail to say why 
uh, they are testing it. Uh, cannabinoid oils have had no Bennett shown no um, efficacy data. Um, there's certainly a role for cannabinoid oils uh, in, in symptom management. Um, the Lyme disease one, um, there's been a number of patients who've had treatment for Lyme disease. Uh, the rationale for combining uh, Lyme disease and motor neuron disease is uh, also a bit tenuous. Um, so I uh, can talk more about that if need be. Stem cells will be offering uh, uh, much, and I think the stem cell work that uh, Brad's doing is really essentially what you should be thinking of when you think of stem cells. Um, the, stem, the stem cell group from Brainstorm in Israel um, are uh, they've also been testing that in a couple of sites in the US. They're probably the closest thing to uh, what could be legitimate. Uh, other sites that have been in uh, China, India, Germany and Italy. Um, in general, the more developed the country is, the quicker they will be to shut down uh, um, what in some cases would be fraud. So um, just about other therapies, and I always say um, to patients that there's no issue at all taking therapies if it potentially could be of benefit for you. Um, the major three things are you don't want it to cause, a lot, to cause uh, unnecessary side effects. Uh, you don't want it to cause unne unnecessary uh, loss of income, as in cost you a lot of money. And also I'd say that if it's going to involve you taking a lot of time out from uh, uh, your family and, where, and who, who you want to be with, then you, know, you probably should think hard. And uh, I still remember a young girl from Queensland who went over to Israel for six months of uh, uh, stem cell therapy and, you know, really she failed on all, all three of those uh, uh, um, uh, fronts. So, you know, uh, I'll put up there and um, perhaps in the interest of time uh, I won't go through them individually. So I'd like to thank uh, all of those patients who've been tremendous uh, uh, inspirations uh, to keep us going, to keep us uh, fighting in the clinic and uh, um, we know it's a really tough disease and there is a really committed group of uh, researchers uh, uh, around who uh, are very determined to try and bring clinical trials uh, to Australia. Thank you.